Good afternoon to all participants of the Cannes Film Market. We are glad that you are back. Good afternoon also if you are following from your YouTube channel. A warm welcome, finally, to all time zones joining us from all corners of the world to make this European Audiovisual Observatory Conference truly global. My name is Susanne Nikolchev. I'm the Executive Director of the European Audiovisual Observatory, which is part of the Council of Europe and based in Strasbourg. This is the second, and actually I'm optimistic, also the last year where we see each other on the screen only. For next year, the plan for the observatory is definitely to have a real live 3D presence at the current film market, as indeed we have had for many years. We will not only offer our traditional conference on site, but we also want to enjoy again with you the exceptional setting of Khan, a setting that is so uniquely fruitful for professional exchanges and that always generates many valuable contacts and ideas. As you may know, the observatory was exactly established with the mandate to build up networks and develop projects in order to provide information on legal and market developments of the audiovisual sector. And all of this in order to contribute to more transparency of information, data and know-how. More transparency is also our goal for today. We want to shed light on the question as to whether there is a shift from theatrical to non-theatrical production. But let me take you one step back. Well before the pandemic, we had found indications that there might be such, such a shift, especially towards high-end series. This aroused our interest in learning more about the actual development of the production industry. Then came the pandemic and we put this project on hold in order to focus our efforts on alerting governments and administrations to the urgent needs of the audiovisual sector as various branches suddenly face a terrible situation. Maybe you remember our documentary on the European audiovisual sector in the time of COVID that we showed last year during the Cannes film market. Maybe you are also familiar with our COVID measures tracker by which we supplied the professionals of the sector with information on nearly 1,200 available support measures specific to the audiovisual sector. Against this backdrop, it is so good to see that finally, finally cinemas are reopening and that film markets can again take place in the real world. Therefore, we are allowing ourselves today to not focus on cinemas or audiences, but instead to have a look at the developments concerning production. We want to share the indications that may point to a shift from theatrical to non-theatrical and ask whether or not COVID might have accelerated this shift. As production is a key link in the audiovisual value chain, we will also have a discussion on what a shift in production might or should trigger in terms of counterbalancing policy decisions. Our panel will therefore look as well at potential legislative and regulatory measures to counteract this trend. But again, we hope not to lose our production focus even in this part of the discussion. And this leads me directly to introduce the very person who has kindly accepted to lead us all through today's conference. Let me introduce to you Guy Bisson, who is Research Director at Ampere Analysis, a market-leading data and analytics firm. Guy is actually also one of its co-founders, and in addition, he's a regular media commentator and speaker at industry events. With this, I leave you in Guy's good hands. Please enjoy the conference. Thank you very much, Susanna, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us, whether you're viewing us through the Marche de Film portal or live on YouTube. Remember, you can get involved and ask your questions to the panelists as we're going through. The structure today is we're going to be having two panels. 
The first is focused on market changes, and the second will drill a little bit more into some of the policy questions that arise out of those fundamental changes in the way that the industry works. Before we get into the panel and before I introduce you to our six speakers today, we're going to see a presentation from Gilles Fontaine, who is Head of Market Intelligence with the Observatory. Let's kick off with that film and then we'll be getting straight into the first panel. Good afternoon. The point of my presentation today is to discuss whether there is a production shift from film to high-end series. And I would like to share some observation that we at the Observatory believe may hint into that direction. I would like also to highlight some differences between film production and TV series production. But let's start immediately with the main question. Is there a production shift from film to TV series? The first difficulty is obviously to define what is a high-end TV series. There is not one unique European definition. In the UK, for instance, any TV series with a budget over £1 million per hour is high-end. But it is a challenge to replicate this threshold in other countries, as budgets depend on local production costs. And it is also complicated because in most cases, budget data is not available. So, at the observatory, we had to go for a proxy to define high-end TV series. And we are talking about prime-time TV series with 13 or less episodes per season. First of all, to get some perspective, let's talk about the volume of production, and here measured in hours. In 2015, theatrical fiction film accounted for 12% of total fiction produced in the European Union. High-end TV series accounted for 18% and TV films for 4%. How did this evolve over time? Let's first talk before COVID-19. High-end TV series clearly increased, but not at the expense of a theatrical film, which remained quite stable at least until 2020. If there was a shift, it was rather for TV movies to TV series. My guess is that broadcasters invested more in TV series to better retain their viewers. So that was before the sanitary crisis. But what happened during COVID? We do not yet have full data for TV series production in 2020. So, we can only look at one example, France. In France, TV fiction decreased less than film. But please note that here we are talking about all TV fiction data. We are not sure this is representative of what happened in other countries. It's also interesting to see that the share of producers in the financing of TV series has increased in 2020. So it seems that producers have kept on investing, compensating to an extent for the drop in other pre-financing sources. But this did not really happen for films. Using still the France case study, it's also interesting to look at investments. And here, the observation is even more pronounced. Investment in film declined by 30% in 2020 in France, but they declined only by 7% for audiovisual fictional content. It's also interesting to look at the investments per hour, and they actually increased for TV even in 2020, while they decreased for film. And that would be consistent with the hypothesis that budgets for film are rather decreasing, while they are increasing for audiovisual fiction. What do we know about budget? It is true that the budget of some episodes of high-end TV series equal or exceed the average feature film budget. But there are wide budget variations, which makes a comparative trend analysis difficult. Still, it seems to us that, on average, 
series remain cheaper than films on a cost per hour basis. Of course, the total budget for an INTV series is higher, but let's note that series are shorter and shorter, and that some series are not necessarily actually much longer than films. Let's now look at some other aspects which are interesting to put in perspective the production of film and the production of TV series. Let's talk first about the business model for production. There is one issue here. At the observatory, we collect financing structures only for films, but we do not have the equivalent for TV series. What we can tell, of course, is that the weight of broadcaster in streamers in the financing of high-end TV series is much higher than what it is in the case of the financing of films. We can also observe two different business models as regards the relationship between the funders and the producers. On the one hand, we have the deficit financing model where the producers retain the IP. On the other hand, we have the commissioning model where the role of the producer is more of an executive producer. For film, audiovisual services were relatively hands off and therefore deficit financing was more the dominant model. But for TV series, the opposition between the two models is an old story. But this old story has been revived by the increasing weight of the streamers. Of note also the fact that the situation strongly varies between countries, and this is in particular due to local regulation. And of course, there are many shades of gray between deficit financing and commission. Talking about financing, is there any shift of the investment of the broadcasters? Here again, we lack data on the financing of TV series, and we have to use a case study, France again. And here, figure seems to suggest that broadcasters may be partly reallocating their investments, but again, these figures include all TV fiction, not only high end. Another interesting aspect is the different role of international co-productions between the two formats. Co-productions are much more common in film when compared to high-end TV series, and specifically if you exclude co-productions between two neighboring countries speaking the same language. This lower share of co-production is probably due to the strong involvement of broadcasters in the financing of TV series and their need to strictly stick to their national audiences. The lower share can be also attributed to the fact that projects commissioned by SVOD players are not co-productions. And finally, we can have a look at the industry structure. Again, there is a certain lack of data here, but we can still make an educated guess that the industry structure of INTV series production differs from the film one. It seems indeed that there has been a significant consolidation process driven by, on the one hand, broadcasters diversifying into production, and on the other hand, by independent production groups becoming bigger. And they are becoming bigger for three reasons, to fund expensive developments, to bridge the cash needs during the production phase and to be in a better position to retain IP. I guess you took from this observation that we have not the same level of transparency regarding a high-end TV series than what we are used to for films and theatrical exploitation. Let me specify what transparency means. It means, on the one hand, let's say an observatory point of view, being able to measure at least the sector volume or the sector revenue. But transparency also applies to the lack of information regarding the individual performance of each series. And with this, I conclude my observations. 
and I look forward to hearing whether the picture trends that the panel will confirm or maybe contradict. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Gilles. Actually, we've had a question in during your presentation, if you're able to take it. Let me read it out to you, just in case. Um, and it's from Maria O'Brien, who is asking, what role do film festivals play in incentivizing the continued production of material for theatrical exhibition? I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. Yeah. Um, so the question is, what role do film festivals play in incentivizing the continued production of material for theatrical exhibition? Well, I didn't look into uh, <coughs> festival exhibitions. My point was rather to concentrate on what's going on on TV series. I just can say that uh, there is now also a lot of festival dedicated specifically to TV series. Okay, so generally positive, probably. Let's let's uh, move on and get straight into the panel. So let me first of all introduce our panelists today in no particular order. Um, first of all, we have Christian Breuer, who is president of the International Federation of Art House Cinemas. Hello, Christian. Uh, Gudni Hummelvall, who is CEO and a producer at Hummel Film, but also the president of the European Producers Club. From Spain, we have Alejandra Panigi, who is Strategic Relations Head for Media Pro, the Spanish production and rights holding group. Joining us from my home country, the UK, we have Neil Peplow, who is Director of Industry and International Affairs for the British Film Institute. Then we have Gregor Pollard, who is General Director of the Association of Commercial Television in Europe. And last but not least, Burkhard Althoff, who is Head of Das Kleine Fernsehspiel for ZDF, the German Broadcast Group. So thank you all for joining me today. As I said at the top of the conference, we are going to start with industry trends and market shifts. So let's get straight into the crux of what Gilles was talking about in terms of that shift from theatrical or potential shift from theatrical to high-end television production and funding. From your experience, and I'm going to start with you, Gavne, if that's okay, um, have you seen a shift? First of all, do you agree with the data that suggests there may be one? And secondly, to what extent do you think that is a COVID blip that will disappear in a year or two's time when we finally get out of horrendous pandemic? Um, actually, I think the shift started uh, before COVID, and I think with the ray. Uh, the, with the rise of the, you know, all the uh, international or global streamers, there was also um, a more demand for content. And I think for most of the independent producers like myself, I have shifted by doing feature films and then also trying to get into uh, the high end um, TV series market because um, some stories are more interesting to tell <laughs> in a longer format than than a feature film, but also to give you you know, more legs to stand on. So I think I think the shift is already there. Uh, I think it will continue after the COVID. I do hope though that the, the theaters and, uh, and the movies will bring back the audience, that we find a way to um, interest the audience, go back into the cinema and experience the wonderful thing it is to share with people and in the audience. So. But I think also as that we as producers need to find a way um, to engage the younger audience so they will come back to to the theater. But uh, yes, I too, I'm talking too much. But yes, I think the shift is there and I think it will stay. And I think there will be an even more um, effort to or, 
uh, for getting content for all the different bro broadcasters and the streamers. So yes, I think there will be more feature producers also producing TV series. Okay. Uh, Neil, let me ask you, do you agree? Have you seen uh, any evidence of that sort of shift? I mean, we've definitely gone through a COVID blip and, and the question is how are we going to emerge and will we be re-engaging with cinema? Uh, and what, what is encouraging is we've undertaken some research and the number of audience members or the percentage of audience members who say that they feel comfortable about cinemas reopening and actually attending uh, has gone up from 46% uh, this time last year to 73% this year which is a very positive uh, sign that they are willing to go back to cinemas and it's a primary uh, source of entertainment and community and, and sharing stories in a darkened room is still incredibly important. Um, and 49% said they're keen to buy a ticket uh, and actually attend compared with 40% last year. And last weekend was the biggest box office weekend in the UK since the start of, of the pandemic. And so, for us, we've been very encouraged by the indication that cinema is by no means uh, dead and and the shift is therefore has therefore happened and that we're facing a disaster. I, th I think actually what COVID has done has forced us to look at different ways of engaging with audiences and, and in particular the London Film Festival for the BFI was an incredibly important moment because it was when we developed a model of, of hybrid delivery. Uh, we were lucky for cinemas to still be open, so we had in venue uh, screenings, but it also meant that we were forced to look at what we were doing and how to increase the diversity of audiences by actually setting up the London Film Festival across the whole of the UK. So, And that's something which I know the London Film Festival team are gonna continue to do. So although there has been a COVID blip, and I'm focusing purely on cinema here uh, in terms of exhibition and distribution, we're encouraged that actually audiences want a sense of community when they're being shown films. Okay, so you're definitely of the opinion that it is a blip and that, that any shift is, is going to be short-lived. Yeah. I, I, no, I think it's a think... blip, but I think it's going, to get, it's going to be same, same, but different. And I think yeah. that, that's what we've seen a lot in this industry. And I'm old enough to have seen several cycles of uh, apocalyptic tales that this is the end of cinema from you know DVD for instance and and piracy which uh, as has been said this this kind of constant shifting of where audiences engage with content is something that we've had to deal with as independent producers and, and as screen agencies but I, I do think the same same bit of, of that is audiences want to see films together and, and they want a sense of community and belonging yeah yeah Gabby, you I want to come in there no, yeah, I just, I, I totally agree that I think and I hope uh, that the audience will be back um, for for the theatre and I think the cinema or the feature film will survive. I, I was just talking uh, from the, as an independent producer, that we, most of us, or a lot, um, tend now also produce for television uh, alongside uh, producing feature films. And a way to survive is that we need to do both um, to, to, to tell the stories we want and also to survive as small independent producers. So, but yes, I do. I think theater will survive and I really hope it will, even if I'm worried of the funding for the feature film, but that's another aspect. Um, one of the things that we have definitely seen, and, and the data is certainly unambiguous on this, is the acceleration during the pandemic of streaming and the dominance, or at least the market power of streaming platforms. Some, not all, but some operate in a slightly different way to what we might be useful and used to in terms of the way that they commission and fund both films and high-end TV series. Um, to what extent have they shifted the way business is done? And is that an issue or is it a benefit and positive for the market overall? Let me ask uh, Gregor on that, please. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a great question. Um, I think what we're seeing is indeed a great level of transformation and dynamism in this industry. 
and that's not new. Um, as Neil was saying before, you know, many predictions were made. Uh, it's constantly evolving, and therefore, you know, trying to tag on some particular views on which, by the way, are my own on this, uh, are, are difficult. But I, I think what's what's interesting is, yes, you've seen in a way many players operating in a completely different fashion or looking at uh, developing completely new relationships between them, uh, new synergies, but also new collaborations uh, in the form of, you know, some, um, some, some broadcasters who themselves have VOD platforms, let's remind ourselves, the majority actually of them operating in Europe, um, you know, will I have through their production arm, of course, uh, you know, relationship with uh, larger, larger streaming entities. And I think we're seeing uh, many different ways of uh, collaborating, many different ways of uh, developing things, which are not necessarily uh, bad. And I think also we, we need to keep in mind, this is a relatively fresh uh, developing environment. So, you know, you're, you're going to see things settle down around a few particular models, but I think experimentation is happening right now. And that's rather good because the consumers are ending up with a variety of, uh, of offers. I think the Lumiere database, uh, the observatory list, uh, more than a thousand or so, if I remember correctly, perhaps you can correct me later on. But I, I, I think, yes, indeed, it's a good opportunity. Uh, and there is some, a lot of positive to be seen in there. Thank you. Okay, but I guess um, one aspect of that is, is there is a shift in the way the business is being done, funding is being done, deals are being done. To what extent is that driving a new way of doing business that is spreading across the industry? So thinking beyond streamers, but to some of the other funders of movies and high-end TV series, changing the way they operate, changing the terms on which they engage with producers, both both around the way they fund, but also around intellectual property um, and who controls and who owns rights globally. Um, Alejandro, come in on this and tell me what you're seeing in the market. Well, I have to say that we are seeing we see what. Um this enormous change because yes, there are a lot of contents being produced uh, from TV series to films. I think it is challenging for producers because we have to really find a way to experiment all the time. And sometimes you can do it quite easily. Sometimes you need a lot of uh, financial um, certainty to risk. Um, I think that there is no one business model today. There is a constant bargain between producers and uh, distributors, whether they are streamers or they are broadcasters. In any case, we, we have to discuss a lot. Um, there is a shift for sure. We are, as media press, producing both uh, films for theatrical release. I would say the, the, the things we are doing now, we are showing now two films in Cannes. And we are doing a lot of series. Um, I think that there is a shift from theatrical to non theatrical and it has to do also with the risk it means uh, for us to work on a film. Until now, we always released on the box office to know uh, how much our film was worth. In the case of Spain, it was you know the box office in Spain. In other cases, it was the box office in US. No, never mind uh, which was the the parameter, but we had a parameter to value our films. And if we lose this, uh, well, we are in a little bit of struggle. And this is what I think that happened. So uh, I agree with uh, Greg that we are all uh, trying to understand how the market works and trying to uh, experiment. But I also have to say that as as a producer and as an independent producer, experimenting is absolutely risking and it's uh, you know somehow tiring so a lot of producers simply go for um, more comfortable way of commissioning things or providing services because it is risky and because the return on, is, on investment is not that easy to uh, value now when you don't have the parameters you had before now we depend on the data that is provided by the streamers for example when it is about a TV series. So, um, well, it is challenging. Sure. 
We've actually had um, an audience question come in here, um, and I'm not sure who's best to answer this, so please put your hand up, otherwise I'll be stuck answering it. Um, do you think the shift from theatrical to non-theatrical affects specific genres, or, the, or does it affect all genres? Anyone? If not, I will answer because we've got some data. We don't have data on the shift in funding, but we can certainly see where streamers are focusing their resources for high-end TV series. And that is in comedy, and it's in what I call genre drama, so sci-fi, fantasy, action, rather than some of the more traditional drama genres. So if there is a difference, I suspect that therein lies the answer. Um, one more question from the audience before we move on with the panel. Um, what are the new funding sources for feature films? Where can equity funding be found today? Anyone want to come in on that? No, Gregor, any, any, any input on that or Neil? Um, I, no, I still I, think equity funding, uh, the, the impact on kind of the longer term revenue streams via you know, local distribution and exhibition uh, is still uncertain. Um, so I think it's going to take a while, as has been said, to actually establish uh, what the new shape of the income streams will be uh, post COVID, but also uh, in relation to uh, streamers entering the market. Um, and that's something which we're doing at the BFI. We're actually going to undertake a review of the independent sector and dig into the impact on business models and what support might be required, uh, both from kind of a development all the way through to uh, exhibition part of the, of the value chain. Uh, and for us, it is about ensuring we have diversity of story, that we have representation of our, ourselves on the screen, which is what the BFI was set up for in 1933. And that's something that we really are going to ensure is, is continues to be part of our remit moving forward. Okay. It's actually um, it's actually quite a nice lead into the next question, and I'm going to bring Christian in on this just to warn you, Christian. Um, so one of the things we've obviously seen while cinemas have been shut during COVID is experimentation around bypassing theatrical. That means going straight to streaming, oft, often with a premium video on demand release. Um, Ampere's modelling suggests that that will not make sense when we come out of COVID, even if there's a slightly depressed theatrical market, uh, certainly for high budget movies. But for lower budget, it's more of an edge case in terms of the economic balance. What's your view on um, the future of that theatrical window? And if films are still getting made and funded, but just going straight to streaming instead of theatrical, does it matter from the perspective of the production industry? Christian, you, you must have views on that. Yeah, um, thank you and hello everyone. Uh, great that you also talk with cinemas about exhibition. Um, yeah, I'm not so pessimistic about the future of our industry. So it sounds like Stone Age, but 2019 was a quite successful uh, year for cinemas worldwide and especially for art house uh, movies. And I'm here right now really in Cannes and I'm watching the movies. And why do we, knew, do we need this movie if we wouldn't have cinemas? So um, I'm not so naive to expect that streamers will do all this. And I have a lot of streaming uh, subscriptions and I know what I see and I know what I not see on streaming. So to me, the key question is why do we finance films? So of course we can do and can say we have a world market, a global market, and we want to give more money to a global market player. Is it in sense of diversity? No, I'm not so convinced it's American. Uh, narrative structures or an Americanized narrative structure for a global market. What we are doing in cinemas is to defend, defend diversity. And I guess in a times of permanent content overload means also that maybe cinema and especially independent local, uh, local based cinema will be one of the most trusted source for watching movies. 
So it's getting more and more about curatorship and getting more and more about uh, quality. And if I see maybe in future less films will be uh, produced for cinema, so yay, it's not my, my problem, first of all. So we complained over years about producing more and more films in Europe, but what about quality? And if you say content is queen, king, then the audience is a queen. So I guess for cinema, it's the same as for, for streamers. It's about quality with a lot of series. Uh, yeah, nobody watched. Same is if we, and what you ask for, it's about quality. What are we doing with this underdeveloped movies? At the end of the day, nobody waits on this movie. Not t cinema, not TV, no film pirate, no one. So if you talk about cinema, I guess in future, we have to talk much, much more about quality. And that's also a question of budget. So of course, documentaries can be cheaper, but if just people who didn't get a contract with TV station come to TV, to, to cinema funds, yeah, of course it's no success. So um, at the end, if we have good movies and exclusive movies in the cinemas, I'm not concerned about good TV shows, not at all. And I guess we have to bring back set in mind. And I guess um, Thierry Frimo said here at the beginning of the festival, who knows a uh, film director from uh, streamers? And if you just watch the, the ratings of this year Academy season, who watched the movies by streamers and who watched the, the Academy Award uh, ceremony. So I guess um, there's still a huge need for independent film production. I'm quite sure of this. And that was also a trend even before pandemic. If a national market was good cinema market, it was due to the national products. It means the cinemas need national product, but it means also the local audience is interested in local stories. And I really do believe it's magic and film is a, it's the best medium to tell stories and people like this kind of public stories. And it's point of an hard chamber for the film industry. We give the social added value to a movie. It's not that not in general as a streamer. So we had always this collaboration. And I guess it was often even in past that good filmmakers even made TV series or a TV movie. So why not? In this sense, I guess maybe this war between cinema and streaming maybe in future is a bit overrated and of course it was a good development last month for streamers and for cinema that's quite clear but i see it in my audience as more people go to cinemas as more <laughs> subscri subscriptions they have so i guess in a best case it could be even a fruitfully um, future but at least uh, a coexistence okay. yeah neil come in on that yeah, no, I just wanted to, I wanted to back that up because um, in 2019, uh, there was a film that was released in the UK called Blue Story. So everybody knows, you know, Downton Abbey and how successful that was in the UK because it was, you know, a well-known brand. But but Blue Story was a first-time feature film director, Andrew Ormo Blue. Uh, he came from a YouTube channel that he created and the series was based on, on a series of clips that he produced for that. Um, and it took five million pounds at the box office which and there were complaints at the time because the people who turned up um they, they were being accused that the film was was inciting audiences to misbehave because you know teenagers were literally fighting to get in but actually what i saw was a much younger audience excited to go to the audience to the cinema uh, to belong uh, and to watch something that they could have watched on youtube in a uh, a screening room in a, in a, in, a, in a multiplex was really encouraging you know, and the filmmakers knew their market. They they built their their their, their following, and the film was actually a really insightful look into um, gang culture within London and had a very moralistic message behind it. Um, so for me, that was one of the most encouraging moments of independent cinema for the last five years to see these new new people coming through, new talent coming through, and embracing it as their main form of communication to the audiences that they've been building up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Gregor, come in. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I just wanted to to follow up on on Neil's point and 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 look at consumer trends. Um, I think one thing that's that's really interesting is 
we're seeing people wanting to go back, you know, to this community experience, which is definitely part of the larger screen, whether it be the TV screen at home or the screen in the cinema. An interesting trend you're seeing in the United States these days uh, is, for example, that actually people have cut down on mobile usage over the period of COVID and grown their TV, consum TV screen consumption. Uh, so these are interesting facets also of a movement that's happening on the consumer trend side. And I, I think it also points to the transformation. I mean, again, I'm not speaking for cinemas, but I would imagine transformation of the cinema experience itself with regard to how it relates and works with premium VOD, uh, whether these be with releases or agreements that are being made right now. So there, there's something to be said about what will, what will be the evolution of cinemas as well with regard to that. And, you know, will they be offering, you know, just premium releases for some great TV shows or, or great movies? Uh, and how they adapt to that audience uh, and those audience needs. Uh, I think that's that's also an interesting facet to consider. Thank you. Okay. And Gabney, did you still want to come in? Because if not, I was going to throw an audience question at you. So that, there's a there's a question come in, and actually, it's a, it's also a good lead into the next. Um, what are the intellectual property implications? of this shift from cinema to sofa. So that's as in the shift in power of the streamers in terms of funding. What are the IP implications for producers? Got me. Oh, and, and then Alejandra. Uh, you're, if you could uh, unmute. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm not muted. Okay. Uh, yeah. I said I can start, but I know that Alejandra can uh, fill in. And of course, uh, the big as an independent producer, the big challenge now is to keep the uh, the IP, and uh, you know they are the way that we uh, financed and structured to make a feature film. Uh, the producer or the co-producers will would you know keep the IP together with the talent. Now, of course, the big fight is, especially for the big global streamers, but I find that the broadcasters are following them in the same. A way to um, um, to to produce is that you know it's hard for us to keep our IP. So at the what we've been working really hard at at European Producers Club is a code of fair practice uh, where we're sort of fighting for for uh, for the producers to uh, to keep a part of the IP because we. Especially with the global produce, uh, streamers, if we keep on just producing before them, we end up being line producers and not being um, proper producers. And that goes back to uh, an earlier said that we will, you know, we will not take care of the, di um, the diversity of the content in in Europe. So I think with the big streamers, yes, it's a very hard for us to to keep the IP. And on the other hand, really want you to add to that? Yeah, basically, back up what Gabney said, um, you know, intellectual property is the only richness we have. The rest is just risk. I mean, uh, when we work and we, we, it is fantastic to, to work a lot and to pay salaries working and uh, producing, and this is fantastic. But we become poor if we don't preserve our IP. Uh, those of us who have been working for 20 years in the market are still living from our IP of the last 20 years. I mean, this is the only richness you have. Uh, and it is a real struggle to retain IP. It is um, part of the negotiation. And I think on that point, we really must be serious because the IP is the only thing that is kept. The rest is Yes, you feed the industry, yes, we work a lot, but if we don't retain IP, we, we simply become poor. And that's something we have to uh, analyze, not only for each uh, independent producer, but also for the IP of what remains in Europe. And I think this is really something we can, we must uh, analyze and we must uh, consider as must. The IP thing is not a small thing, it's the basis of our our business of uh, our capacity to risk and our capacity to recover because from all the projects we finance some of them are super successful but a lot of them are not a success and this combination of something that fails somehow 
in the market and you cannot avoid it. And some other things that are a good success is what really uh, keeps our um, independent production alive, which not only uh, gives nice uh, films or nice uh, TV series or whatever, it is a complete change, a complete environment that is kept alive. It's a complete value chain what is working under the IP thing. I mean, this is a huge thing. I, I think we have to really consider it as, as a key uh, cornerstone uh, of our industry in Europe. So, um, in yeah. summary, losing control of IP and that model spreading beyond streamers to other players within the industry. Um, yeah. Burkhard, from the perspective of a broadcast group, um, do you have any view on the changing model for funding production and who gets and who controls the IP? Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I, uh, from the from my perspective, as I'm working with uh, young talent mainly, um, the, the changes with streamers are very interesting because uh, the, the let's say war for talent has become much fiercer uh, in the last years, and uh, COVID has been like an accelerator in the whole uh, in the whole um, development. Um, basically, but basically, I would agree with Christian that um, there are two worlds now, uh, and I see that talents are traveling between these two worlds much more than before. So, uh, for example, uh, a young director like Nora Fingscheid, who did, did System Crasher, um, who won Silver Bear in Berlin Film Festival, she then went directly to do a Netflix film with Sandra Bullock, and she probably will travel back to Art House Cinema um, later on. Um, I think um, art house cinema and cinema will always offer opportunities to talent that they value a lot and that streamers might not uh, give talent um, as art house cinema can do. It's the artistic freedom, uh, more individual uh, expression. And <clears throat> I think that um, streaming um, programs have a certain tendency to, to deliver a kind of gentrificated uh, program, which at one level it seems to be local, but on the other level always has this gentrificated uh, global um, touch. Um, for us as a broadcaster, to, uh, we, we, we like to uh, co-produce, we like to co-produce cinema, we like to co-produce also high-end series. We have a broad range of co-producing models. What makes it difficult for us is that um, the legislation, at least in Germany, um, um, says that the streamers can acquire co-produced films, cinema films, um, by public television in the theatrical window. So this, for us, makes it a lot less attractive to co-produce cinema as our direct uh, competitor, which the streamers have been developing in, now use films we co-produced before we can use them. So a potential audience uh, that we want to, to reach with these films um, is reached before we can address them. So uh, there's a point which is really difficult for us in the legislation uh, and which might harm the very positive um, relation between podcasters and, and uh, cinema. So um, I think this will have to be addressed uh, in the further uh, legislative um, um, procedures. So just to clarify, you're saying that in Germany, streamers can co-produce, then take the rights for theatrical, or, or, or is that in, for the in, subscription in Germany, window? Yeah, in, in, in Germany, for example, in the, in the case of um, System Crasher or Berlin Alexanderplatz, these were films co-produced, theatrical films co-produced by, um, by ZDF. And then they go into cinema and then they, you have the theatrical window. And then uh, these films are sold, licensed streamers. And they will, are shown in the theatrical window time, in uh, the, the, the time we can broadcast on the streaming platforms. And then after 18 months, they can be used in, uh, by, by the co-producing um, uh, entity. 
So this is totally different with, for example, France. Uh, I think it's excluded, and and this makes it for us in Germany uh, harder and harder. This investment. I mean, one of one of the other things that the streamers are doing, and and I'm not sure it's a major market shift because arguably the major Hollywood studios did it prior to the streamers, but that is tying up writing and production talent into long-term, sometimes exclusive or first-look deals. To what extent is that impacting the uh, difficulty of getting feature films, but also high-end TV actually made? Neil, you come in on that one. Yeah, I mean, we are, we are seeing talent being tempted away by um, bigger deals than an independent film can offer. Um, and that, that's not just talent, but also crew. You know, that one of the things we are facing is production in, inflation. But um, I think ultimately uh, the question that, that the streamers will need to, to ask is how, how is new talent developed and found and curated? Um, and that's always been in the UK uh, where the independent sector has always had an edge. And actually um, on an endless scroll, how do you highlight the next rising director or actor? And so I actually think festivals and the exhibition circuit that crafts and, and curates and offering to audiences will be really important. And it will remain the job of, of producers and selectors and critics to, to sift through the films and the talent to discover you know, those moments of artistic clarity. Um, I think for the BFI, it's how do we support producers to do that? And I think ultimately the broadcasters, the streamers, um, and the studios have benefited from the independent sector taking that role. Um, and longer term, if the independent sector is impacted in a, in a negative way, it's, it's bad for the BFI because diversity of story is, is at, at, at the BFI's heart. You know, the, the Royal Charter says we need to reflect back to society an, an image of itself through film and TV. But also the ecosystem would have been damaged and longer term, the streamers might not be able to find the talent that they need to uh, sustain the subscription rates that they've been seeing. Hmm. Okay, yeah. so, I, yeah, go, I, go I, me I, and I then Christian. Just, yeah, I was just going to say that I totally agree uh, with Neil because uh, what we uh, as independent producers are fighting for when we also go back and talk about the IP that makes us have a possible to also have a business is that our main part, except for making good content, is to find the new talent and make sure that we have a diverse Europe. And like uh, um, Bukart said, that we we not everything are sort of um, looks like it's local, but it's been mainstream. So we have to find a way that the different institution or a business model being it for the broadcasters or the film institutes to help um, the independent uh, producers have that power to spend that time and the money because you know we develop a lot of things that never turns out good and it's lost so we can look for that new uh, talent and also find ways to do um, interesting and new ways of getting people back into the theatre and keep Europe as diverse as it should be. So it's very, very important. And that's also, I will, I know I re repeat myself, but why we um, at the EPC have been fighting and also getting a lot of people to support us for the code of fair practice uh, to support and to keep the independent producer in the heart of the production and to develop new and exciting uh, stories and talents. Christian, you still want to come in there? Because I, I want to squeeze yeah, in one yeah. more question, but go ahead. Okay, just just short and bring it together what uh, Burkhardt said and then um, the others. To me, it's um, I'm not set, uh, afraid of uh, less films are produced, but um, it's about this war of talents. So, of course, I'm afraid of if the best talents would produce in future only for, for streamers or, or television. Uh, of course, it would be a threat. And I guess 
right now, I guess it's first of all about actors. It's first about of people in the film industry. So on the other hand, and that's quite interesting to me, uh, it's about diversity. And I guess the future of cinema is diversity. Maybe also some of the streamers are doing this and maybe it's for every one of us, but it is the field where you can really have um, a cinema beyond, beyond the uh, mainstream. And I guess wherever market concentrates and set what we have right now, and we have players there are really with a big market power and try to dominate the market, but where markets concentrate, there is room for niches and maybe that's a big chance for the European film because one side are the big US players, on the other side, uh, China gets more and more dominant. So I guess we have uh, different languages, different cultures, and of course, it's also part of the weakness, also the, the medium-sized companies in production, in distribution, in cinemas, in world sales. But at the end of the day, I guess we have to make a, a strength out of it. And I guess that's, I, I'm really believe in it. So again, <laughs> key <laughs> quality is the key for it. But I guess we have to bring it together within this changed market. And of course, the market after pandemic will be a difference than before. Thanks. Neil, very quickly. Yeah, very quickly. And I think I couldn't agree more with what has just been said. And and we also completely agree that co-production actually is a way for us to be able to find you know other independent partners to be able to counter um, some of the squeezes that are happening within the, the finance um, plans of, of, of UK independent producers. And the Global Screen Fund now has a, a minority co-production fund Focus purely on that, you know, where the UK partner is in the minority and it's looking for reciprocity and developing networks and developing relationships. Because I think as an independent sector, we can only really understand the future of it if we're working together to find the solutions. OK, I, I, I want to ask one final question, sorry, and it's three people can answer. So it's the first three hands to go up. Um, we're in the middle of a production boom. There is no question of that. There is some research that came out of the USA last week that said that boom is about to collapse. Um, I'm interested in one word, yes or no, do you agree that it's about to collapse? If you do agree, what would your reasoning be? Who wants to answer that? Hands up. No one? <laughs> Neil, okay, go for it. No, I'll probably Neil, Neil. Uh, I'll probably wrong. Wrong. Uh, yeah. but, but I think, in, in recession or in, in times of need, people need entertainment. And I, and I think the demand for content will continue to be there. Um, and I think that we, we probably see a plateau of, of demand, not necessarily a, a bust. But yeah, I, th I think actually that, 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 that what we're seeing is a, an additional amount that's being added to the, uh, the, the, the industry pie, so to speak, rather than something which will then fall off. Yeah. Uh, Alejandra. Well, I think uh, people need more content, and more content is to be made, uh, and it's, it's to be produced, and it's to be filmed, and it's to be released, and it's to be consumed. I don't think that content uh, will diminish. What I think that uh, we will see is uh, a kind of business model uh, challenging. I don't know if if the uh, people would would like to subscribe to one or two or twenty uh, streamers to see contents. I think. We have to make a differentiation between uh, how people consume content and what is the content available. So I think that we really find um, a kind of challenging situation in the business model, not in the content. And I don't think it will collapse, honestly. I think it will simply grow. Okay. One, one more, Greg, Greg, or last one. Come in. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's it's a bit of classic case of supply following demand. That that is to say that yeah, you you probably see a bit of a glut because of course with COVID there was such a, a, a attention and focus uh, finally as a you know a seller's market right uh, for a lot of need for content. So yes, you will see it a bit plateau, but as as the others, I don't think that will that will necessarily uh, you know uh, create a collapse. 
what's interesting indeed is more to watch out uh, with regard to, to consolidation and how the different players in the ecosystem are going to balance out. Uh, because before we're talking about, you know, independent producers, uh, there's also the question for broadcasters who have integrated production as well and how these integrated producers uh, will fare, uh, given that at the end of the day, I mean, this is, it's nice ecosystem, et cetera, but we haven't talked about the GAFA in this and, you know, necessarily their, their weight uh, and how, you know, the, the broadcasters who invest, you know, majority into, uh, of their earnings into this ecosystem uh, are, are hurt by this, uh, whether it be because there's a different level playing field and they don't have the same obligations. So, um, yeah, interesting developments to look at. Thank you. Brilliant. And obligations is what we will be talking about in the next panel as they relate to policy. So I've been very naughty. I've stolen five minutes from our next panel um, because we were supposed to finish five minutes ago. But without further ado, we are going to hear from Mayor Capello, who is Head of Legal Information for the European Audiovisual Observatory. She's going to talk us through some of the policy issues that are facing the production industry, and then we're going to go into the second panel on that topic. So stay with us, keep asking questions. Sorry we didn't get to all of them in the last panel, but we will continue to answer as many as we can. Let's hear from Mayor. Whenever there is talk about public policy, there are always two questions to address. First, there is the why. What is your policy purpose? Which policy goals do you want to achieve? And then there is the how. Which measures do you intend to put in place in order to achieve these goals? In the case of the promotion of the production of European audiovisual works, be they intended for a theatrical or for a non-theatrical release, explaining the why is rather easy. European films and other audiovisual works are culturally valuable, they face strong competition from outside Europe, and they suffer from a rather weak circulation outside their country of origin. These three reasons put together make a compelling case for a regulatory intervention. Having solved the why, there is the how question. As Shakespeare would have said, aye, there's the rub. Introducing measures that are conducive to adequately promote European films and other audiovisual works can be a quite intricate regulatory exercise. First of all, the works must be produced and states may support production by providing state aid, be it direct funding or tax incentives. Furthermore, they can decide to impose levies, taxes and financial investment obligations on TV and VOD providers. But even this is not enough. What is the point of getting your film financed if you do not manage to get it shown to an audience? To this question, there is an answer in the form of quotas and prominence obligations. So much for the why and the how. There is actually a third question, the what. What kind of European works is going to be supported by all these measures? Any kind? A particular kind? Films made for cinemas or for TV? TV movies or TV series? Documentaries? And how are these decisions made? Let's start with state aid. Film funds and tax incentive schemes operate within a legal framework. Concerning EU member states, State aid provided for cinematographic and other audiovisual works must be compatible with the common market. The European Commission assesses whether this aid scheme respects EU law and very particularly rules regarding state aid for audiovisual works. This assessment is based on the so-called cinema communication. For certain schemes, the general block exemption regulation may apply. Now, when it comes to our what question, the cinema communication provides a simple answer. All of them. That is, the cinema communication does not make a difference between works, be they cinematographic or not. This is a logical consequence of the principles on which EU state aid policy is based upon, namely the promotion of culture. 
It makes sense, therefore, that the European Commission makes no distinction between types of works as they all may contribute to the shaping of the European cultural identities and the enhancement of cultural diversity. That is also why the media strand of the Creative Europe programme provides support to every type of audiovisual works, including films, TV series, documentaries, video games and immersive content, and to cinemas, festivals, VOD services and industry markets. This is the EU level. But what happens at national level? Many national film funds actually make a difference between cinematographic and other audiovisual works in many cases. The funds can decide to have different lines of funding for different types of work. For example, films intended to be shown in cinemas, TV films and TV series. Aid intensity may vary depending on the type and format of the projects. Also, when a scheme targets different types of work, it is normal that the minimum thresholds and the maximum caps are different for each of them. All these options translate themselves into concrete policy choices made by each fund. For example, the Flanders Audiovisual Fund, the cultural public funding body of Belgium's Flemish-speaking community, makes a clear distinction between cinema and TV. The Film Fund co-finances the production of individual films in various genres – fiction, animation, documentary and experimental film, Feature films, medium length and short films are all eligible. The Media Fund focuses on the co-financing of high quality television series developed in co-production with a Flemish TV broadcaster. This includes fiction, animation, documentary and cross-media developments of TV series. Tax incentive schemes can also make the same difference. Probably the best known example is the UK Creative Industry Tax Reliefs. These are a group of schemes that provide fiscal incentives for the production of cinematographic works, high-end television, animation and children's television programmes. As I mentioned before, there is little reason in getting your work financed if there is no audience to show it to. At European level, the Audiovisual Media Services Directive contains rules on the promotion of European works, both on broadcasting as on on-demand services. For common memory, TV broadcasters have to reserve a majority proportion of their transmission time to European works. In addition, 10% of their transmission time or 10% of their programming budget has to be devoted to works created by independent producers. The obligation for VOD services has been changed in the latest revision of the AVMSD, which took place in 2018. On-demand services must secure at least a 30% share of European works in their catalogues and ensure prominence of those works. Member States may also require these services to contribute financially to the production of European works, including services targeting audiences in their territories, but established in other Member States. Now, when it comes to our what question, what kind of works, the AVMSD provides the same simple answer of the cinema communication. All of them. That is, the AVMSD does not make a difference between works, be they cinematographic or not. Nothing is said in the directive about obligations to support any particular type of works. The directive does not oblige member states to introduce financing obligations for the production of European works either. This is the EU level. But what happens at national level? Many member states have decided to introduce financing obligations for the production of European works. And the number of them actually make a difference between cinematographic and other audiovisual works. And this is because the AVMSD allows member states to lay down more detailed or stricter rules with regard to services under their jurisdiction, provided that they respect the fundamental freedoms guaranteed by the treaty. As I said before regarding film funds, the different choices made by individual member states for the transposition of the AVMSD are due to policy choices made by each state. For example, in the French community of Belgium, the public service broadcaster RTBF 
financing quota has a specific subquota for TV series, but not any series. It must be French-speaking Belgian television series, local and popular, which can enhance the identity of the Valonia Brussels Federation and the regions that make it up by being based in the Valonia Brussels Federation or by highlighting its heritage. As you can see, there is a clearly stated policy choice made here. And again, different countries make different choices. In Greece, a choice has been made to impose financing obligations concerning the production of cinematographic works on broadcasters, both public and private. A similar obligation goes for satellite operators distributing pay TV services and telecommunication operators distributing audiovisual media services via the internet or mobile telephony. In other countries, a system of subquotas guarantees that different types of works are sufficiently financed, but always with a particular accent set on the financing of cinematographic works. In Spain, for example, the pre-financing obligation for broadcasters has a subquota of 60% allocated to cinematographic films and another subquota for of at least 40% to films, series or miniseries made for television. As you can see on the screen, France has a complex system of investment obligations depending on the type of broadcaster in question, and the same could be said about the Italian system. These are only some examples. As I said before, different countries make different choices, different choices that evolve in time due to shifting priorities and market and technological developments. But in the end, they are just that, policy choices, subjective decisions about what needs or deserves to be promoted. Thank you very much, Maya. And um, now we're going to go into the second panel, which will dive deeper into some of those policy issues. Um, for those of you who've joined us partway through, let me quickly reintroduce the panelists. So joining us on this panel focused on policy, um, you've seen them before, but we've got Christian Breuer, President of the International Federation of Art House Cinemas, Gadney Hummelvoll, who is a CEO and producer of Hummel Film and also president of the European Producers Club, Alejandra Panigi, strategic relations with EU institutions for media pro in Spain, Neil Peplow, director of industry and international affairs for the British Film Institute, Gregor Pollard, who is general director of the Association of Commercial TV in Europe, and Burkhard Ulthoff, Head of Das Kleine Fancy Spiel for ZDF, the German Broadcast Group. So thank you for joining me again. Uh, policy, and we've already had some questions come in, believe it or not, so we'll get on to those in a second. But let me start by asking a general question, and it's going to be a, a, a case of hands up again, please. All of the industry shifts we were just talking about, so we were talking about COVID, about streaming, about how others in the marketplace may be shifting the way they do business, intellectual property control, and many other issues that we touched on. Of all the industry shifts that we've seen in the last year or two, which one is regulation most behind on? Who'd like to come in on that? Alejandra. I think on the whole, I mean, uh, Maya just said this is policy choices and I think that obviously regulation is much behind everything because the market is going very, very quickly. So I think we really have to uh, go for all of those big things you talked about and work on them quickly. All of them are ahead. Okay. So poor, poor marks from Alejandra. Um, but Burkhardt, do you want to come in? Uh, you're, you're on mute. I, I agree that uh, Alejandra said that the market is moving very fast and that the regulation uh, is not depicting the, the realities, that uh, the, the chain of value or the use of, of value has to be uh, 
become more flexible because each film even can be uh, a different case. And, and we have very, at least in Germany, we have very strict changes of, of value. And uh, this makes um, a very unflexible system. And this makes it for us, at least as a podcaster, every time more difficult to participate in, 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 in what we want to participate and what we what would we like to support. So more flexibility, uh, more individual cases uh, would be necessary. And Christian, what's your view? So um, I know about this uh, debates about media chronology and we had some before and we will have some now and there are kind of collapsing windows. Of course, we have to see cinema as an entity. If we stop watching cinema as an entity, it will lose. I believe, I strongly believe in public storytelling, but of course we will need kind of an exclusivity for, for Windows. If there are changes behind, it's clear. I am also be, would say, I'm a bit afraid of to talking about the small movies to reduce the window. So we need quality movies again. But if you ask me, the key question for future is um, the regulation of internet. So the market needs strong antitrust measures to limit the dominance of a few players and to prevent multinational mega mergers. I guess it's a big threat, of course, for cinema, but first of all, also for our democracy. And I guess we are way behind. Everybody's welcome to do his business. Streaming is reality. So coexistence, streaming TV, streaming TV and cinema is what we have. But we really need strong regulations here. We all have it in our markets. And I guess it's a really big threat also to our economics if we don't um, act here. Right. Gregor, I think you wanted to come in there. Yeah, I wanted to strongly support that uh, last statement. I think indeed, um, if, if, if you look at this ecosystem in terms of, of looking at investments, uh, whether it be the funds, but whether it be the public broadcasters or commercial broadcasters, uh, the media program, all of this, um, what we're looking at is essentially completely different. Uh, story with regard to our interactions on the internet, uh, and indeed having that kind of regulation to address. And we know there's a Digital Markets Act, which is currently being hotly debated in uh, in Europe. Uh, we see the same in the U.S. emerging. Uh, will help uh, towards leveling that playing field, uh, which is essential because essentially all the players we see around the table today are players that reinvest in content. Uh, we face if in, in front of us, some players that basically go for the same audiences, uh, perhaps take a different view as to how IP is managed, but also in terms of uh, you know their investment in content. So uh, keeping uh, that virtuous circle of reinvestment, it's going to be essential to address that first and foremost uh, to ensure that uh, we can continue doing so clearly. Well, I suspect my next question, Burkhardt, you're going to have a view on. Um, Given that we are in a situation where streamers are becoming significant funders of both movies and TV shows, um, do we need to rethink the theatrical window as a measure of value for content as it moves through additional windows? Well, I, I think we have to rethink this window. and. Um at the same time, I agree with Christian that there must be a, a safe space for cinema and the use of cinema. But uh, uh, the, the whole scene has changed. In, in Germany, for example, the, the streamers were considered as something like um, a DVD uh, platform or something like that. This has changed totally. And uh, still in Germany, it's... it's uh, it's uh, the legislation is as if uh, streamers would be uh, like renting a DVD. But uh, uh, matter of factly, the streamers have become broadcasters in their own uh, right. So uh, the legislation is not uh, considering this and they can um, act within the, the, the window. So earlier I said one has to um, consider 
more flexible use of windows. And uh, right now, um, there's one legislation for all films, and uh, there might be films that need this broader window. There might be films that um, within this window are dead. You know, they're, they're, they're 18 months, they, they are two months in the cinema, then nothing happens. Then they go 18 months later, they, 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 they see their audience again or not. So um, what I think is that legislators should think about uh, a system of flexibility of uh, individual looking at every project and uh, give every project its own right. Uh, I know it's difficult, it's, uh, um, but it would be very helpful for all the players in the ecosystem, as has been said. Uh, Neil. Um, no, I mean, I think you know, the BFI has a, a, a cultural view on the importance of cinema as well. In the, um, you know, we want to open cinema up to new audiences and important, uh, accentuate the importance of the diversity story that we've spoken about. Um, and we're very strongly committed to cultural diversity in in all its sense. Films across the entirety of Europe. We've actually established a new um, fund which is set up to distribute international help distribute international titles within the UK. Uh, because it's in our charter to promote the widest range of British and world cinema, and it remi remains in our charter. Um, because we believe cinema is actually the sm smaller cinemas, the, 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 the multiplexes, they, they do serve a really important role in community. I mean, dur during COVID, we were uh, supporting them with the Cultural Recovery Fund to keep cinemas open, because sometimes the cinema is the only place where communities gather um, to engage with, um, with with an art form, and that those community cinemas also helped deliver food packages. They were places where people gathered who were lonely. They were actually really at the heart of a lot of communities which um, kind of rely on them. So I think we also look at them not just in terms of a more commercial kind of perspective in terms of theatrical windows, but actually the contribution that they make to mental well-being to community is just as, as equally important to us. I think it was Christian, yes, you, you, you have somebody. So, so no wonder that, that I defend uh, the windows and uh, exclusivity for films. I really think it's necessary, but also, first of all, we have to see a reduce or collapsing windows means a shift of revenues. That might be the case for each movie, but in general it is and of course, I see the world behind cinema is changing. So I really understand Burkhardt and I guess also more flexibility wouldn't be a problem at all for cinemas. But of course, it must have or there must be fair deals for cinema. And at the end of the day, we are a business. Of course, we can't negotiate a thousand movies a year. But um, I guess and I see that we maybe even come with a lot of players. Um, uh, to, to good deals for both sides, because at the end of the day, just to make it clear, the best what would be, could be happen for a real theatrical release would be a success, not just in cinemas, but also in the other um, in the other field. So um, I'm not worried about, and I guess even still, cinema refines movies. So what would be Parasite without can? What would be Parasite without? Uh, a theatrical release, I'm pretty sure not that much many people would have seen it and would know the movie and will, will know it for centuries, so, uh, <laughs> decades at least, sorry. So, and then we have to talk about, it's about public money, so the market is free. But if we talk about public money in Europe, of course we have to ask why do we support producing these movies and I guess back if I look on France, the strongest window system we have here in France, and it has the most diverse cinema market. And I guess that's a win-win situation for all. And I really <laughs> agree that sometimes it's maybe frustrating for producers if, say, movies have to respect a window. So still, I understand the problem of Burkhardt. But um, that's maybe a surprise for having all the cinemas that we need for the next releases. And I guess that's why, of course, market has changed and we have to have looks and need new deals for time after pandemic. 
but I can just say and can just defend, have a look on see this you will need in the future. <laughs> One of, one, of, one of the issues that um, we have if we are talking about window flexibility and changes to the value chain overall is that one of those windows, if we consider streaming a window of its own, um, has no access to the performance or viewing data. Uh, that data is retained internally. To what degree does, does that need some regulatory or policy input. Uh, Alejandro, you have a view, I think. Well, I think that the access uh, to data is the basis of a lot of businesses, not only ours. So we really need data and we need uh, data not only because we deserve it, but also because it really helps you to shape the business. So uh, there has been a big discussion whether we need transparency or not, if the streamers have to be transparency on the market or not, or which way, et cetera, et cetera. I think we have already faced this a lot of years before, and we found a way to uh, get data. When the, imagine a world where broadcasters would tell you, you know, this film succeeded or not, and you would just trust them. This is not possible anymore. I mean, we really need data that is not provided by marketing strategies of the streamers. We need data. They, I think we deserve it, but not only the producers, also the consumers, also the the people who work uh, as journalists uh, uh, criticizing films and contents. Um, I think consumers have the right to say, well, this film succeeded or this TDC succeeded, so I will watch it or not, and uh, not driven by the marketing decisions of a streamer, because in the coming years, we are regulating now for the coming years, and in the coming years, we will not have five or ten, but thousands perhaps of streamers. So the consumer has also the right to know, and I think this is this is fair with the whole environment, with the whole ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think data is vital, um, and at the Global Stream Fund, we've actually doing research about what data producers, financiers, sales agents would want. Um, and then rather than waiting for policy at this point, we're going to see if there's any way of us being able to construct those data sets um, and then make those available. Because I think, as has just been said, it's, it's, they're invaluable if you're trying to plan your business. Um, and as a previously as an independent producer, it was always difficult to get complete transparency around, say, DVD sales in different territories. And that's always been a disadvantage for independent producers. But is there a way of us being able to give visibility in terms of the way social media is engaging with a particular title or particular talent. Is there, are there data sets which are out there that we're, we're not aware of that we could be using? So that's something that we should be publishing a report on uh, later this summer. Right, well, I certainly look forward to reading that. Um, one of the big issues, and it's a market issue, that we touched on briefly is um, consolidation. And clearly there is massive consolidation ongoing if you like, at the head of the chain, the start of the chain in the production base among the major studios, among the major studios and other large international groups, um, Amazon MGM, for example, but there are many other examples as well. Two-part question, really. To what extent is that an, an issue for the industry? And to what extent does it increase the need for policy and regulation to protect smaller independent producers. Alejandra. Well, it seems to be I'm quick today to raise my hand. <laughs> I, I think that whenever you have monopoles, you're on a risk, no matter in which market. In ours <laughs> and in any other market, if you have such a big players that can really squeeze producers or governments or consumers or whatever, then it's not good for anyone. And uh, this uh, consolidation of such a big players are an issue for all of us from the production point of view, from the distribution point of view, from the pricing point of view, from every point of view. I think we really have to be careful on that point. Okay. Anyone else want to come in on that? Otherwise, 
I, I was just uh, going to say. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say I totally agree. Um, I think it's going in the even if it's going in that direction, it's going in the wrong direction with the few players sort of deciding what the rest of the world should do. So uh, I think it's not a good good solution. Okay, so I'm going to uh, play devil's advocate here. Um, the streamers are funding, as we've established, lots of new content. Much of it is TV, but some of it is also movies whether they see a theatrical release or not. Um, given that those streamers, and, and it's not just Netflix, it's Amazon, it's Disney and others, are increasingly investing in European production rather than US or alongside US, do we actually need more regulation to encourage that investment or should we just leave it up to market forces? Neil, any view on that? I th I, first of all, I don't think you can count all streamers as having the same business model, and therefore I think there's going to be a level of detail in in the policy which will need to be really dug into. Um, and you know, the way that Amazon uh, counts success in terms of a, a show may be linked to the sale of white goods on its on its main store. So even getting the, the data that's needed out out of them will take time and will be very complex. That doesn't mean that policy isn't necessarily the the right way to go. It, it's just, as has been said, it, it can lag and it can lag quite significantly. So by the time the policy is in place, everything may have changed again. Um, I remember doing searches on a search engine called Alta Vista and that no longer exists. And um, I think we just got to keep in mind that flexibility that was previously spoken about. Um, and I, I, however, what I do think is encouraging is that English language territories are much more open to seeing films with subtitles or that, that have been dubbed. And I think the success of Disposant and uh, the Casa, the Papel and Dark um, shows that the market really is global. And I think that is a genuine opportunity and very exciting. Um, and I think how the AVMSD quotas and the uh, sub quotas that we ha had demonstrated to us earlier, how that plays out is something that we need to, to look at because um, obviously the UK has AVMSD in place and, and will be um, ensure, ensuring that it's implemented uh, and even we will be looking at how that's impacting our diversity of story and, and also I think in terms of encouraging independent cinema it, it, it's for us about having that independence of voice as well. Um, there was a report out recently about the Britishness of, of certain streaming programs and whether or not they had a you know, mid-Atlantic mid um, perspective and, and were we at risk of losing our Britishness and, and I think um, that's something that the BFI has to really focus on. Um, it's ensuring that we remain um, true to our, the reason why we were set up in 33, and that's a policy that's lasted nearly 100 years now, um, which is about using film and TV as a way of, of exploring who we are as a nation and as a people and, and sharing that internationally whilst also understanding other people's nations through film and TV. And I think we just have to also hold on to that whilst we're having those discussions. Okay. I did see another hand. Um, Gadney, you, you come in, and then Gregor. No, um, I I do believe that in regulations when it comes to even if Europe is difficult to regulate because there's so many different uh, uh, for each country there are different ways of treating it. But I think it's important that we find a way so we have the reinvestment and to keep the diverse. Uh, content. On the other hand, I have to say, coming from a small country myself with a, a small language group, uh, that the streamer has come, you know, they have also helped, like uh, Neil was saying, that suddenly um, countries uh, have more money to also uh, produce high end because, you know, f coming from a low capacity country, the the broadcaster would not, you know, have enough money or we didn't wouldn't have a way to finance um a show in our uh, own language um, and that would you know be considered high end. So it has helped and it has done a lot for um, um you know spreading content uh, and that um all over Europe. But I think if we just let the market rule. Um, I think the, the diversity in our culture and who will be able to produce uh, will um, 
will go the wrong direction. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Gregor, did you want to add anything? I well, just, I mean, rebounding on the last comment, leaving the market rule. I, I mean, as far as I can tell, you know, with conversations from my members, uh, it's pretty regulated. It's not very regulated market uh, in in the commercial TV sphere. Uh, so obviously, we we bear uh, these obligations, and that's a great thing, right? It, it delivers cultural diversity, etc. I just be careful of regulatory intervention that creates another layer of uh, of, of of red tape for broadcasters. Uh, thereby limiting their cap uh, their capacity to reinvest. So if we're looking at indeed regulation, coming back to you know uh, very focused competition interventions like the DMA and whether it's these activities from a gatekeeper, yes, I would say that is uh, indeed something that we look forward to in terms of the consolidation of the industry. Um, you know, the the TV market uh, and, and TV companies, I think for for many years have been arguing that you know they need to grow internationally, et cetera, to continue to compete with very large players which dwarfs them in terms of capital market size. So um, I'm, I'm not sure that you know, more regulation on them would help. I think on, on the contrary, uh, we want to have a, a, a leveling up of obligations uh, for certain players and for broadcasters, perhaps leveling down uh, to enable them to, to grow and continue to be part of this market. Um, because or else I, th I fear that you know, uh, this consolidation Will continue, but it will continue in a way where you know some European implanted players uh, will no longer be in it, and and that can't be a good thing, of course. Uh, and and of course have to think about what that means in policy, right? You have uh, we were talking about AVMS early on, quotas. Uh, look at the application of quotas today. Some would argue that actually those quotas are are helping and pushing this consolidation uh, rather than create diversity. So. Sorry, just uh, adding a few a few elements there in terms of our vision of how we see this. Yeah, sure. And I think, do you still want to come in, Christian? Yeah, Christian. So uh, I, I make it short because I guess we agree we need more regulation. Um, I guess media market has always been regulated, and that's also the reason why we public fund it. Again, if it would be a good functioning market we wouldn't need public support we wouldn't need it we need it for diversity i'm still sure we need it for democracy and i want just to add one thing of course also it's um about uh transparency of data but it's also about transparency of algorithm what we need because if we don't need what's getting produced why if we don't know what do we see either if it's on Google or if it's on a streaming platform? I guess it's a big risk for us all and it, it destroys the economy. And I'm quite, maybe I don't know, but it's discussed quite hard in America and even more than in Europe. And maybe we shouldn't just watch in this market uh, monopolization, but we should also watch in the discussion about regulate the market. And because we know we can maybe regulated on a European level, but even better in a more international way. And it's, the, the problem is quite bigger than our market, but of course it drives our market. Okay. Well, quite as um, obviously a hot topic, and indeed we've got an audience question, uh, and this I'm afraid is going to you, Neil, as the UK representative. So I knew someone would ask this, so thank you, Anita Mukas, who's asked this question. And she says, the EU must lessen its consumption of English language product. How do the panel see this directive operating? I, I believe this is referring to press reports suggesting that um, UK content with regard to Europe-wide quotas, um, re reliance on it should be lessened. Um, Neil, what's your thoughts? No, I... I... I truly believe that um, we have a, we've not left Europe. We, we've left the EU, and and we are committed to cultural diversity within Europe, and and that's the entirety of Europe in film and and television. And, and I think um, to be asked whether or not people should be consuming less English language film and TV series is something which. For me, uh, the BFI is a, a, a direct 
kind of focus of the work that we're doing in terms of developing you know a, a stronger independent sector and the, the review that we'll be undertaking in the in autumn uh, and we do see that cultural collaboration with europe and and also with with uh, beyond is something that is going to be important, increasingly important within the independent sector, and that's something else that we're focused on. So, uh, you know, I don't want to talk about um, particular languages or particular approaches. I just think we we all have to understand that we do have to consider whether or not we see ourselves on screen, whether or not we hear our accents, our languages, our phrases on screen, whether or not we continue to understand our colleagues, our families, our cultures and our communities that are spread across the whole of Europe. And for me, with a you know a culturally diverse family from Switzerland, it's Italy uh, and and the the UK, uh, I see myself very firmly as, as European. Yeah, sure. And just a point of clarification on that. Um, my understanding is that any such change would require uh, an adjustment to the ABMS directive. Yeah. So it's not a and simple yeah, the, thing. Yeah, it's not a simple thing. Sorry, it, it, you're absolutely right. It's not a simple thing to change through legislation. We we are putting in place in the UK a new uh, state subsidy regime, which um, includes AB and the cultural tests will remain. Um, and we are committed to implementing AVMSD in the 30% quota. Mm. Okay. Can I just come in? Yeah, no, I, just, I just want to clarify. I mean, um, I, I know British tabloids love to um, to, to portray uh, Brussels in, in a specific kind of way, but um, I mean, clearly changing the definition of European works is not on the political agenda. Um, I think most of Europe is still in the process of transposing the reviewed audiovisual media services directive. And that's based on a definition of European works that emanates actually from a body that hails where the observatory hails from, which is uh, uh, the Council of Europe, right, for the European Convention on Transfrontier Television. So um, this definition includes UK works, but it also includes a lot of other works uh, which are outside of EU member countries. And I, I don't think it would be a, a good thing uh, for the broadcasting sector in Europe and actually for the whole creative chain right now if this notion were challenged, um, and not to mention a breach of, of international agreements. So I'd say that, you know, despite Brexit, what we're still seeing is a lot of collaborations going on, and that's a great thing. Um, clearly, you know, we should focus, I think, on, on building bridges, not burning them at this stage. There's enough volatility going on. And yeah, that's, uh, that's our view on, on this issue. All right. So there seems to be general support across the panel for quota regulation in particular, and the 30 percent that is being imposed on streamers uh, and international streamers of 30 percent European works. To what extent, though, do they go? Sorry, Gregor. Yeah. I just want to clarify, our organization has never uh, supported the quota system just because we do not believe that it uh, allows us for the flexibility I was talking about earlier on uh, in order to compete in this environment. Okay, good. So your answer to the question is they go too far, but my question, the wider question is should they in some respects go further, specifically around the, where the money goes? in terms of that investment into European content. And anyone got a view on that? To protect independent production, to um, you know, move investment into certain segments, cultural diversity, audience diversity, diversity of voice, whatever it may be, do, do we need additional policy input? Uh, it is it is something that we are exploring, like I say, through the review um, and undertaking a consultation when the new uh, director of fund arrives, Mia Bays. Um, so I suppose watch watch this space. Yeah. Okay. What about um, the the issue which is affecting the wider rights market, which is effectively that the large producers, and we've talked about consolidation and concentration of power 
at the start of the value chain. Increasingly, those large producers are keeping that content for themselves. So a lot of content that previously was sold down the chain after the theatrical release into the international market to broadcasters, to pay TV operators and others is not finding its way down that chain as readily. To what extent is that an issue for the wider market? Because on one side of the coin, you could say that therefore gives more opportunity for the truly independent producers and creators. On the other side of the coin, you can say it fundamentally alters the way that money flows through the industry. Is it an issue? Does it need policy? Um, is it a non-issue? Any views? Alejandro. Well, I basically think we have to analyze the whole circle. I mean, uh, the issue is not on the production side. The issue is on the distribution. So if, the, if the, um, the big players are able to produce and to distribute, and they distribute their own content because this is their business model, then the problem for independent producers is not on the production side, but on the distribution side. So no matter um, how it is, if you have few players distributing and those who distribute basically produce, then you have less windows. And it's 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 a whole it's a whole uh, thing. Um, if the the distributors that produce keep the contents for themselves, yes, we do have more possibilities to produce content. It is true there is more, more space for the independent production. But where do we show it? I mean, the production is not something. You produce yourself with your own money and then you throw it to the market. You know, the, how the production works is from the beginning, from scratch, since you think about the production, you already think about the distribution. It's not a, a, a product that you can finish and then sell it. So the whole circle is um, complicated when you have players that keep, I mean, that have the possibility to keep content and then release it. The whole is shit. To, to some extent, and I, I've made this, yeah, Christian, come in. Christian, I think so. do you want to come in? Yeah, yeah, um, thank you. Um, I guess, of course, it's a question of distribution, but it's also a question about audience. And we do so that for, for each European movie, there's so many, uh, so much audience outside. And we release more and more films uh, in cinemas. And even just in July, we opened the cinemas and have, I guess, 100 theatrical releases in one month. That's incredible. But um, at the end of the day, I started last week my cinema. And the opening weekend was really good. And we have almost 30 movies that we screen. And at the end of the day, the audience watched maybe 70% yeah. was interested in one of these titles. And I guess if you talk about European movies and not about national blockbusters or Hollywood blockbusters, then it's still a big question, how do we circulate them? It's a question, of course, of the language if it's not produced in English. And um, I guess if we, we, we talk, and I guess that would be my critic on the film funding system in Europe, it's much too focused on, on production. And we would need a much more holistic approach from the idea to the audience. And if we don't develop the audience, we can produce again and more and more, but um, it won't succeed in cinema and it won't succeed anywhere else. That's the reality for most of movies. And just to having a large number of films or have a large number of countries where a film theoretically is circulated, but not seen by anyone. That's a diversity that doesn't exist. And I guess what we have to do, yes, we have to talk about quality. We have to rethink about production and maybe even look for new business models. But what really is a hard work, but a very sustainable work, sets audience development. And otherwise we can, uh, discuss about production and production again, but uh, since a reality, uh, most movies have less and less audience. Since it's just a reality, we watched before the pandemic that more movies doesn't lead to more audience. 
And um, of course we have some big screeners, but um, we need a bit more reality and we need to bring it together, the production and the audience. And just to clarify, when you say movies have less audience, do you mean within the theatrical window or across all windows? So uh, we don't know the numbers about streamers, not officially, but um, I remember uh, the numbers um, of Roma in streamers and that wasn't that impressive. Um, mm. So, um, no, I, I mean, in, uh, in, in theatrical release, if I watch the European films, then we have more and more movies that have less and less figures. And at the end of the day, if a year was a successful for us, um, it's dependent on a few number of movies that might be different movies in the mainstream market to the art house market. So it's different movies in my cinema. But at the end of the day, if I have a parasite, then it's a good year. If I have Tony Erdmann, then it's a good year. But if the top movies don't work, so my art house ten falls, then I have a problem. And these movies are still kind of the power engine for all other movies because then people watch trailer and come again and again. So for example, my company exists since 40 years and 2019 was the most successful year in this 40 years of history. It's not that bad. And I know it's a rocky way back to this past, but um, I guess really we need to talk. And if it's, we are here about the European films, uh, then we need to talk about audience development. Okay. And Neil, you wanted to come in? Yeah, just to push that a bit further, because at the BFI, we are really focused on diversity and, and ensuring that we are finding those people who have stories that they want to tell who haven't previously been brought into organizations like ours. So we, we think there's the importance of diversity throughout the, the value chain has a huge amount of cultural and commercial value here. Uh, and actually, the example I gave earlier about Blue Story is for me, a real kind of beacon of hope that you can find audiences who, once they start to understand, they are welcome to tell their stories and that they can then own their audiences. Cinemas is somewhere where they have an ambition to show them and where people will go and see them. And I think organizations like the BFI haven't necessarily done enough work to reach those communities who, who don't feel like the BFI belongs to them and wouldn't have come to us for funding because they would have thought, well, we'll, we'll be rejected. And I think. That for Ben Roberts, the new CEO, is a real focus. How do we make ourselves more accessible? Find those communities, those networks of people who are underrepresented, give them a chance to tell those stories and actually then find those new audiences, which maybe we haven't nurtured. And that whole idea of audience development, for me, we've been focused on a particular area of policy. What about education? How do we educate people about the films and cinema? And then through that, process, get them to understand that actually they can start making films themselves and start reflecting back who they are and understanding the human condition and those around them. I think just to, to, to take the policy discussion a bit further, there are other areas that we could be looking at which can also help actually longer term uh, with the sustainability of the independent sector. It, it raises a, an interesting point and we've got two minutes left, so answers very quickly. And of course, it's the most complex question for last and slightly metaphorical. If if audience and investment is shifting to high end TV, should regulation and policy thus encourage investment in that direction to create more work for producers, independent production, etc.? Or should policy's role be to protect the theatrical window? Um, who's, Where's the balance for regulators? Because on, on the one hand, you've got a booming production industry for TV. Should we be encouraging that? Should we be focused more on protecting theatrical? Got me. Uh, yeah. It's not a, a very logical answer, but because I love the feature film and the theatrical, I think we should fight for keeping it and um, keeping and finding the audience that we need. Uh, so I don't know how much you should be a regulator or not, but I think we as an industry and as an independent producer, 
And with all the distribution and everything, I think we will have to work together to find a way to to keep it and make it flourish again, because I think it's a very important uh, part of uh, our industry and art form. So that was uh, my just my heart uh, talking. Okay, I think I think most of us are, are, are film fans, definitely. Yeah. Christian, did you have one last input? If so, we've got about thirty seconds. Yeah. Of, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So. I guess cinema is not just a platform for movie. This is in mind. And with in mind, it's about public storytelling. It's about our society. It's about our local communities. Of course, we have to defend it. And um, also, I guess the TV market, and I include the streamers to the TV market, is a big global market. Um, of course, there are opportunities for market players, but, but cinemas has, has a role um, beyond. And I guess that's why we need to deserve it. I'm really sure about this diversity. And I know if cinema dies, an art form, at least as we celebrate it right now in Cannes here, will die too. Thank you. I'm afraid that will have to be the last word. So if everyone on YouTube, everyone on the Marche de Film portal who is watching, please join me in virtual applause for the panelists, uh, Christian, Gutney, Alejandra, Neil, Gregoire, and Burkhardt. Thank you for all of that input. It's, it's been a fascinating couple of sessions. And I am going to hand back to Susanna, who's going to lead us out with some final thoughts from the observatory. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And uh, I will just try a little bit to wrap up by going back to our initial question, which was, is there a shift in production from theat theatrical to non-theatrical? And um, I think the answer there is a general yes. And uh, the further answer is also that this is a shift that uh, predates COVID. But then, as we heard, I think at the very beginning from Goodney, maybe there's a simple reason. It's just uh, another leg to stand on. And what we focused uh, later on was what is what really matters and also matters very much to the cinema industry is quality and diversity. And it's not necessarily a problem if we have more high end uh, TV series, for example. There is also a strong community sense and a sense of belonging that keeps cinemas going. But what we really focused a lot later was the question, uh, do we need to see action in order to protect a little bit the funding of the content and the actors who are really engaging in that, being uh, because they are obliged to, being because they are convinced and want to do so. And that's the question of the level playing field and our discussion about the streamers and the further discussion to what, what extent there should be policy adjustments or even regulation. And without saying, because there we might not have a consensus, but I just want to name some sub points that really mattered and that we discussed which were uh, monopolies, so to see what antitrust law can and shall do. Certainly, Windows seems to be a big issue, but also what was called the war for talent. So there is a real uh, big competition. And also the uh, question at the very beginning, uh, we talked about this, and I believe it's quite important, the IP rights situation. And then last, but definitely not least, um, the audience. And this brings me to also thank this audience for having taken the time to listen to us. Really, I hope you took something away and that you will join us again next year, as I said, then in person. But before I let you go, I want also to come back to the um, sentence that there was a need for data. This is very dear to the heart of the observatory and I can already give you a little data back in terms of a fact check that we have quickly done. You might remember that Craig mentioned um, that we have a database, which is actually the Mavisa database, where we also report on streaming services. And that database continues currently uh, information of 769 streamers. 
you can uh, access this free on the internet through our website and I'm sure this category will fill up. We will certainly uh, keep watching it. So this was my little fact check and that really leaves me to also thank all the panelists. Thank in particular Guy who had a fantastic way of guiding us through the day and even kept perfectly well the time. And uh, I also would like to say a big thank you to my colleagues, Maya and Gilles, for their contributions, but also to Alison, who you haven't seen, who was all the time in the background for technical and communications matters. And without her, this would not have taken place. Also, and this comes from my heart, big thank you to the souls of the film market, that is Jérôme Payard and Michelle Waterhouse, who always make this cooperation possible year for year now, for 20 years at least, that we can come and be present at the film market and this year in this hybrid form also with the opening to the public world. A big thank you for all your support and interest in our work as well. With this, for those who are in John and can enjoy the beach, the sun, we have rain here in Strasbourg where I'm sitting, Enjoy the summer, all of you, and stay healthy. Thank you very much.